Well, welcome to the March 2022 monthly reading series, reading of the Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium. This is our 23rd Zoom-based reading. We've been at this just under two years. We didn't do a reading the first month of the pandemic when everything was shut down and thereafter we went to Zoom. So we're still on Zoom, delighted to see you. Thank you for joining us in these times as we work through still whatever's left of the pandemic. And most of us would like to see that it doesn't hang around, but I'm afraid that it is. And uh, I was reading yesterday about a variant of Omicron called BA2, which is now uh, starting to work its way through unvaccinated uh, populations. So we're in some kind of new normal, if that's what we can call it. Uh, with the pandemic, we're trying to wind down. Mask mandates are being uh, taken away. And then we have a war in Eastern Europe, an invasion that is, in my opinion, absolutely uncalled for. And from what I've seen and read, uh, horrible. So these are challenging times. And it's nice to be able to be together Thank you so much for joining us as we sit back and really escape in a way, but move ourselves is probably a better way to put it into the world of poetry. We have two fine poets who are going to share their work with us. Uh, and uh, what you'll be able to do is lean back, listen to them, and enjoy the company of fellow poets under the auspices of the Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium. And as many of you know, the consortium has been around in various forms and under various names for a long time. Uh, it uh, was started by some poets who uh, are not with us now still, but others who are, and among them being uh, Jennifer and, of course, John Lowey. Uh, John was the local representative of the National Writers Union chapter in the Monterey Bay area, and these readings continued uh, with a robust uh, energy under John's uh, uh, National Writers Union leadership. John Lowey is the Dean of the Consortium. Kent Leatham is our leader and our coordinator. And between the two of them, we've got a wonderful lineup of poets that are being developed, a lineup that is being developed for the coming months. We're on Facebook at Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium. If you haven't gone there and checked us out, please do. If you'd like to like us, we would like that. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium on YouTube. And I would urge you to check that out and to subscribe, please. Well, today we are going to enjoy poetry from two outstanding and gifted poets, Stephen Kessler and Alejandro Mujia. Uh, we don't yet have Alejandro with us and are trusting that he will be able to log in from up in San Francisco before the reading progresses. Each of our poets will read for 20 minutes or so, and uh, we'd invite you just to sit back, enjoy them, uh, have a cup of coffee or whatever beverage you have handy, and uh, simply let go and uh, enter into the world of poetry for the next hour or so. Our first poet is Stephen Kessler. He's a poet, an essayist, a translator, a journalist, and an editor. Last Call with Black Widow Press is his 12th book of poems. And Stephen, will you be reading from that today? Yes, yes, I Great. will. That Great. Is, that is what I'll be reading from. Wonderful. Uh, Stephen's translations from Spanish have won numerous awards. Uh, his opinion columns appear regularly in the Santa Cruz Sentinel and the Monterey Herald, and his literary essays are in the LA Review of Books. So he's, uh, he's a prolific uh, commentator and writer, as well as a great poet. Stephen lives in Santa Cruz, and if you want to learn more about him, he has a website that's easy, stephenkessler.com, that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-K-E-S-S-L-E-R.com. And uh, I've gone onto the website. It's, it's a nice website, and uh, it's a it's a good place to spend a little bit of time. So, Stephen, thank you for being with us. Over to you. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, you mentioned 
uh, Last Call, which is the book I published last summer with Black Widow Press. So it's, uh, even though the poems aren't new, the way they're put together and presented uh, is a, a new work of mine. Uh, seems like about every five years, it takes me about five years to write a book of poems. So uh, I'll try to introduce you to a, uh, an assortment that is a, there's lots of different kinds of poems, different moods and modes. Uh, and I'll start with uh, the overture, which uh, was written a couple of years ago uh, in the very first days of the, of the pandemic. Um, and it, it's called After the Plague. Decided to you alive with no screen between is something worth trying not to die for. But who are we now? And would we know each other after this long exile? Protected by these antiseptic hazmat suits, these hand sanitized plastic gloves, these plexiglass shields, these protocols of the tested and the disinfected. For a while, we were mostly human. But that was in another century. Since then, we have sacrificed to survive the reign of terror of the microbes and the clueless rulers. Deprived of funerals, we grieve from an unsafe distance where what we've lost feels farther away even than the absence of your presence. You I saw for the last time, one time long ago, when our next embrace, our next meal, was guaranteed by our existence, by our appetite for intimate understanding. Now it's not so clear. I'm not so sure. So much has occurred. Even remembering is beyond reason. This is a poem about, uh, about aging and time. It's called Gray Eminence. My t-shirt today is gray, my shirt is gray, my beard is gray. I am a gray man in a gray mood. Though the sky is blue and the flowers of the farmer's market are yellow and the lips of some of the Saturday girls are red and the fiddle and mandolin music is bright as a summer morning in the mountains. I was up there once and remember its green smell and the sweet blue black stains on fingertips that had picked wild berries on a trail along the creek. But I have been shrinking incredibly, inexorably, to fit a more urban flat on death row where my reduced footprint will go unnoticed because of my advanced youth. I don't seem bereft. I had my fun and did what I could to help. But the headlines tell me it's all over and I can't help wondering if I made a bad turn somewhere, took this out of the way road to my dream and lived it largely awake and woke up to nothing much but these sheets of lost beds with loves in them and pages of poems. I always got mixed up with those mates. I could hardly tell them apart until it was too late. Now I write them letters in my sleep, confessing everything, but they don't reply. That gate is shut. Garden gone wild, no way back. This must explain my eminence above all. So far removed I have gone gray, cloud-like in my darkening lightning. A friend of mine called my attention to uh, an entry on, on Wikipedia for something called the Kessler syndrome, named after uh, an astronomer who uh, discovered it or named it. So this is called Kessler syndrome. The epigraph is from Wikipedia. 
Kessler syndrome is a scenario in which the density of objects in low Earth orbit is high enough that collisions between objects could cause a cascade where each collision generates space debris that increases the likelihood of further collisions. One implication is that the distribution of debris could render space activities and the use of satellites in specific orbital ranges infeasible for many generations. Kessler syndrome. Instead of attending the apocalypse festival, millions of emergency last meals of vanishing civilizations serve to long lines of dazed refugees, strangely savoring every moment before it's all over. The unmoved monk stays home and meditates emptily while the world whirls through his skull like a brainstorm. Brilliant idea gone bad and spun into nothing flying debris and piles of ruined possessions which by their moldy wreckage prove their pointlessness. Sirens of first responders wail and warble above the combustive hum of weekend cars on Route 1, everyone trying to escape, which is why the acolyte is hunkered down, comfortably ensconced in the sacred bunker across from Holy Cross Church and the Zen Center. He is unaffiliated, unfit for human company, and thus unaccompanied even by a cat, much less the maid of his dreams who left him long since for stranger embraces. Wounded gravely, still alive enough to delight in a smile delivered brightly across a counter, he allows that pleasure too to pass through and prove him porous, holier than most in his riddled condition. The thorns of life had no velocity. They guarded cultivated beauty in some English garden, but the projectiles slicing the wild sky are un unidentified flying junk, not romantic at all, and they can kill. Nothing to be done but relish the rhythm of the roofers hammers across the street, proceeding as if shelter were still possible. This, uh, th there's a whole section of this book called Benefactors, which uh, are poems uh, either addressed to or about various uh, people in my life, uh, poets, uh, family members, friends, writers. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a letter to Bukowski. Dude, you've been dead for more than two decades and you keep on publishing new poems. How do you do that? Oh yeah, I saw the files of Black Sparrow in Santa Rosa when I was living up on the coast, recovering from massive heartbreak. And because your voice on dark nights made me laugh and your letters always took me seriously, I drove in one day to see your partner, Martin, and he showed me the long drawers where he'd stashed your poems to bring out later in your afterlife. On a gray day in Surf City, passing through Logos, I found a stack of one of those books, remaindered after seven printings, one of your lesser sellers. You make it look so easy, and you make it new, in a way old Ez would have hated, maybe. But like Sinatra, you did it the only way you couldn't help doing it, the only way you could. You, as few others in this sorry business, are good company still wherever your ashes blew, wherever you are, whatever dive bar or desk you're sitting at, still typing and drinking, drinking and typing. So uh, speaking of uh, drinking, there's another section of this book, which is, um, called Ghost Bars of California, which are poems that were written uh, in public places, uh, bars, cafes, restaurants, concerts, park benches. Uh, I, I, find, I find the uh, the world 
in general and its distractions very, uh, very stimulating and inspiring. And I frequently um, will just take out my notebook and uh, riff on what, uh, what is going on. This poem is actually written after uh, <laughs> an episode in a bar. It's called, and this is the title poem from the section, it's called Ghost Bars of California. Juliet Binoche, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Pope Francis are in town. I saw them at the Nickelodeon, and after the movie they adjourned, like me, a few minutes later, to Oswald, a cool restaurant named after a presidential assassin, where a man drinking a martini had started a conversation with me just before they entered and took seats at the other end of the bar. A couple of stools to my right, I heard, how's it going? He caught me while I was musing on the good looks of the staff. Talking to me? He was, and he needed to talk. And the bartender was busy with the new customers, white robed, black robed, and sexually disheveled in Parisian nonchalance. So he told me about his family's ranch in Hollister, and how he had made and lost two fortunes in business and showed me on his smartphone some of his photographs from a book he was working on, Ghost Barns of California, and that he'd grown up around great wine because one of his grandfathers was a vintner and he loved to humiliate sommeliers by asking them a trick question about the wine because he couldn't tolerate pretentiousness and that his grandmother had been an English professor at Stanford and knew six languages. He ordered another martini and told the bartender to bring me another beer, whether I'd drink it or not, I could look at it. And he kept talking. I was distracted and kept glancing over at the celebrities as if the bartenders and waitresses weren't attractive enough. But the man's monologue was interesting. He was giving himself a pep talk to try some new thing at 53, his black and white photo book or some startup something or other that would get him through middle age in the style he liked. He said he used to write poetry, but decided it was self-indulgent. I agreed completely, but then no more so than telling your life story to a stranger over drinks. I finished the second Pilsner and wished him well. We'd probably meet again at this marble slab, but when I turned, La Binoche, RBG and the Pope, had paid their tab and gone. This is from the same section of the book uh, called Meeting Your Shrink for a Drink. Meeting your shrink for a drink. What could go wrong? Are your dreams leaving you? in need of an explanation for your erection? It is only a sign that you are still alive in the morning of one more day of no relief for what you thought you needed, a sensitive interpreter of your subterranean hungers or what or whoever is unrevealed at dawn, the face of her you miss most, unexpectedly exposed across a counter a bar or cash register behind which eyes and a shy smile brightly shine for a few seconds, serendipitous, a flash of refreshed pleasures remembered, even if never again made flesh, embodied in the one always missing, always missed. Your shrink could illuminate this over cocktails if she would only return your calls, but she too is suffering her losses as grievous as yours, and she can't confess, must possess her bereaved self as you do yours, a strange privilege shared only with your most intimate interlocutor. Rainy Girls. I'm in love with all the brainy girls. Their sexy thinking seduces me every time. Their talk about everything is so intelligent. Their letters are full of touching revelations. 
even their emails are intimate. And back in the days of face-to-face -face conversation, before the age of the prophylactic mask, to see their lips as they spoke so crisply and smartly, and to catch a dazzling glimpse of their eyes brightening, was to feel a tender bondage laced with the sweet pain of longing to be one with each of them and polyamorous with all. This plural intimacy is not promiscuous, but a deeply selective adoration and gratitude for shared understanding. The brainy girls are the women I grew up to love at impossible distances and closenesses. Here's a, here's a sonnet. There's a few sonnets in this book. Several years ago, I translated about 90 uh, Borges sonnets for a book I edited uh, of the complete sonnets of Borges. And it, uh, it, it reawakened in me uh, a, a formal uh, habit that I had when I was just beginning to write poems. Uh, when I wrote a lot of sonnets. I started writing sonnets again, and uh, this is one of them. And the sonnet is, of course, a debatable form. Um, according to some people, it's a, you know, it has very specific rules and has to rhyme in certain places and has to have a certain number of, of uh, beats in every line and, and uh, lines in the poem. And I, I do adhere to the 14 line rule, but Beyond that, I think the sonnet is an improvisation that uh, can be made to uh, feel like a classical sonnet, even when it's a modern sonnet. So this, this sonnet is called The Perfect Poem. The perfect poem is where you want to live, lingering in each line as you read, through to the end, and then read again, gaining more of its music and its meaning in circular motions that move through you, leaving a little residue to reside somewhere inside where it remains, by heart where you have it when you need it. But you can't live there, it lives in you, as long as you retain those lines, moving in circles in your mind and time. Spheres of influence where you find rhymes, arriving in rhythm as the world turns, as if it were a place where you could live. So, uh, this poem is from the final section of the book called Pandemic Cadenza. It was written uh, New Year's Eve of uh, 2020. Little did I know. <laughs> I thought I thought 2019 had been a pretty bad year. Um, and this is uh, my intuitive response to the New Year's uh, 2020. It's called ringing it in. <coughs> Excuse me. Why am I not sleepy at midnight on New Year's Eve when I've been sleeping so badly all these weeks and explosions are going off downtown, everyone out there trying to have a good time, sounds of bombs and gunshots to celebrate a random click of the clock, sounds of rockets sizzling through the sky, faint voices yelling by the town clock where the cops are watching for drunks getting out of hand under the floodlights, a desperate night as the oceans rise and fires close in on the cities and waves of fascists and racists mount their thrones to rule as presidents for life while the stateless bed down in squalid camps at the borders, waiting for doctors and lawyers who never arrive. And homeless addicts set off fireworks because a horrible year is over and another even worse one had begun. But I should be tired, but the itching keeps me alert. And the more I scratch, the more it itches. So maybe I'll stay up reading and writing all night.
but probably not because I'm already tired of the effort, the futile exercise, the stupidity of the noises in the street and the sounds streaming through my head and down my arm into my hand and through the uniball signal onto this page. That was a product placement for my uh, favorite pen. I'll read, uh, well, Alejandro, is Alejandro here yet? I guess I'll read one or two more and uh, I'll leave it up to uh, Bob to direct. Yeah, why don't you um, give, us, give us a couple more, Stephen? Um, I don't see Alejandro on board yet. Okay. So this is called uh, Dark Dahlias. Dahlia is the thick, dark color of Cabernet, bought on impulse at the farmer's market the other day, are starting to wither in the Italian pitcher, scored at a yard sale years ago in Lalala. The succulents in pots on the terrace need some attention, transplants to bigger pots, soil amendments, more room to bloom. I will go on spraying the aphids as needed, will cook my soups and compose salads, and whip up smoothies in these purgatorial days of existential suspense. No telling what's next in the epic serial of one day after another dealing new twists in the dealt hands of hopeless gamblers, playing our last chips with no lucky lady. She has struck out on her own adventure, moved by young male muses. Those handsome dudes have everything and they're giving her what she needs. Not an ace up your sleeve nor a switchblade in your sock will get you out of this mess. The whole casino is a house of cards and a hurricane. Your hand blown every wrong way with horrors around every corner and no secret annex nor righteous benefactor to protect you. And even if your private luck holds out, the world beyond, the world around is beyond repair. That's why these gloomy flowers will have to do brightening the day with their wine dark light. So I'll, uh, I'll finish uh, my set with uh, another uh, occasional poem uh, called The Night Before I Turned 74. I'm listening to Pablo Casals play Bach on the Bose player instead of Muse residues of which the music cleanses. Inside history, you need to know what's going on, but don't kill yourself with information. It will still be there after a break. Almost my dad's age when he died, I'm still alive. The same as ever, almost, except for the plague and the lockdown and the reactionary attack on democracy and reality by the very special. I miss my place of worship, Kawumba Jazz, and movies at the Nickelodeon, and happy hour at Lupolo, gabbing with a friend, admiring the transient beauties over beers and tacos, ordinary pleasures. But I have more than enough for now in my film noir, Mediterranean airy, with half a dozen masks, the New York Times, friends' books, friends' paintings, Friends closer than ever, thanks to distance. I swear I saw dark brown eyes, brown skinned cheekbones, dark brown hair with chestnut highlights above a black mass and intelligent sentences spoken by a mouth I couldn't see and I wasn't dreaming. Such mixed messages, paradoxical double binds, old age, young desires, drunk with poems and romance, blasted and blissed out on beauty. These are the wild, dark, wordless thoughts the cello speaks. So that was a, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, and uh... The book is called Last Call uh, from Black Widow Press, uh, available at your local independent bookseller or can be ordered by them anyway, um, or uh, through the publisher, Amazon, you know, the usual, usual places you find books.
So thank you very much for your attention and uh, over to you, Bob. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, and certainly available at Bookshop Santa Cruz, huh? Uh, it's definitely available at Bookshop Santa Cruz and Bad Animal Books in Santa Cruz and possibly at uh, the works in Pacific Grove. Uh, I'm not sure if they ordered it, but I sent them some promotional materials and it could certainly be ordered uh, through any bookseller. And as you say, through Amazon too. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I you know, it was, um, you had this wonderful line, the perfect poem is where you want to live. And uh, we got to do that. Uh, we got to go into your perfect poems and live there for a little while this afternoon, which was great. It, um, uh, it brought back memories of the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, there was some hope there. Um, the, uh, the phrase, uh, even remembering is beyond reason. Uh, I like that uh, because uh, it's not reasonable to remember some of the awful stuff that's happened, but but it's there. And um, we uh, do, as you say, we're proceeding as if shelter was still possible. Uh, and uh, we have sheltered in your poems, uh, for which, uh, which we thank you. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. I don't know that we do have Alejandro with us. John Dotson posted in the chat uh, that uh, maybe possibly it's the time shift uh, has uh, derailed Alejandro's uh, uh, timing, um, which is too bad. We will have to see what we can do about having him come on board at some future time. Kent, I'm sure will be able to attend to that. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank you all for uh, this time together this afternoon. Uh, Stephen, thank you for making our afternoon as wonderful it has turned out to be. And uh, thank you for sharing. And I love the fact that in this digital day and age, you have over your right shoulder, what looks like a dictionary to be open and read. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I still use, I, I actually just love the physical, the physical experience of, of, of a dictionary, you know, turning the pages and, and seeing all the, all the, all the words all around, you know, the word that you're looking for and all the kind of serendipitous accidental association. That's why I still like to read a newspaper on paper. Uh, and I still, I still write on paper. Um, uh, first drafts of pretty much everything. So uh, yes, I, I'm very retro, retro, uh, retrograde or retro, uh, <laughs> retro uh, analogous. Uh, you're, you're retro real. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, virtual, no. uh, you know, I mean, it's nice to see you all, but I'd rather see you in a room together than in little boxes on a, on a screen. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, it's so much, I find it so much easier to flip pages back and forth rather than trying to move screens around and all of that. And uh, I hate to admit it, but I'm one of those people who actually enjoys reading the dictionary. Uh, just word after word, it's kind of a treasure hunt that you don't intend to start on. And then when you find these little gems, uh, they're, they're wonderful to take with you. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, we, uh, we are going to do this again in a month on Sunday, April 10th. Uh, Bill Miner and Buff Whitman Bradley are going to be our two readers, and they're here with us in the audience today. And we're looking forward to hearing them. It'll be again via Zoom, and it'll be somewhat uh, celebratory in the fact that it will be our 24th Zoom session. We will have been at this for two years, and Bill and Buff will be two wonderful uh, poets to help us uh, celebrate that. For more information about what we're doing in the Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium, please contact Kent Latham or John Lowey or me. Uh, you can do so at my email address, which was on the invitation that I sent out, and I can give you Kent's and John's addresses uh, if you'd like. Just to note again, we're sponsored uh, here by Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium and Old Capital Books, which is a wonderful bookstore in downtown Monterey. Uh, two terrific people who own it and run it, and uh, they're friends of ours, and we are friends of them. Uh, be sure to like us on Facebook if you haven't done so already. 
And uh, please stay tuned uh, and in touch via Facebook and also by way of our YouTube channel. And as I mentioned earlier, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Well, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you again very much. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, uh, Stephen uh, to stay a little bit. We'll do a screenshot uh, with Stephen and uh, we'll look to see that on our Facebook page a little later on today. Thank you all very much. Uh, take good care and uh, we'll see you next month. And uh, if not before, bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you, Stephen. Wonderful stuff. Thank you. Thank you.